Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. Hey, we actually have an IPO to talk about, a big one coming up uh, here. We want to get right to it. Bailey Lipschultz, he covers all that IPO stuff and all the new market stuff uh, for Bloomberg News. Uh, he joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. All right, so Bailey, Arm, it's part of the it's, uh, SoftBank. They need to convince the market that as a chip designer, they are a great play on AI. How do they do that? The big sales pitch is being in AI, being in machine learning, being in, and we looked at the filings, um, the company actually only mentioned AI about 50 times, but the big focus will be when they're talking to investors is how they can get and become really a staple of those chips that are going to increasingly be used to bring AI to things like your cell phone and be able to incorporate their technology into uh, data centers, which obviously are very, very lucrative for the technology in the semiconductor space. Now, so, the, the challenge there for me, Matt, sorry to interrupt, Matt, but yeah. is because the challenge is if I'm sitting on the other side of the table or I'm at the rubber chicken lunch in New York, I'm, my thing is, but you guys aren't. So I have to believe that you're, you aren't now really an AI play, but I have to believe that you're going to get there, right? Yeah, and they, according to their data, are in something like 99% of smartphones. So their yeah. whole pitch is that smartphone market is drying. We've seen that play out with earnings from Qualcomm, earnings from Apple. Well, now they're trying to skate to where the puck's going to be, okay. data centers, AI, and being able to use their technology and have uh, customers use their blueprints, which they sell, collect uh, royalties, some nice royalties off of uh, other companies using that. And that's kind of where they're trying to position themselves really – not saying NVIDIA is one of their many customers, but they name dropped NVIDIA a few times as people who they're operating um, and working with and letting them use some of their AI technologies. So at, what has NVIDIA said about ARM? I mean, are, aren't the two pretty closely connected, not, more than just sort of a customer um, relationship? Yeah, NVIDIA was set up to buy the company. Uh, a few yep. years ago, and that deal fell apart. Um, the big thing when you look at some of these uh, Bloomberg reports is that Arm is talking to what they're framing as strategic investors. NVIDIA, according to Bloomberg reports, among those potential investors alongside the likes of Amazon and Intel to actually buy into the IPO. So you're trying to look at the way Arm's positioning itself to benefit from not only selling to these customers and benefiting from their sales, but also getting them to buy into the stock, which, you know, creates kind of that familial environment for uh, SoftBank, which has had a pretty rough go losing uh, $30 billion last year. Yeah, this would be a big home run for them. Great, great story related to this on the Bloomberg Terminal by uh, my buddy Alex Barinka and Min Young Lee. It says, Arm needed 3,500 words to explain its China risk before IPO. Wow. So they've got a China risk here. So I guess investors have to get what is that risk, I guess? Arm laid out that they uh, generate about a quarter of their revenue from China. And that's driven by Arm China, a unit that basically them and SoftBank are partnered with, but they don't control. So there's uncertainty around mm. slowing demand in China, which we've been seeing play out. We've seen in the filing that the company's royalties coming from China actually slowed in the last fiscal year. They warned that that could continue to slow. And that's all on top of geopolitical risk with the U.S., U.K., anything going on uh, as it relates to China um, and Western countries. And you look at some of the reactions we've seen from Bloomberg Intelligence really laying out that China risks paired with slumping smartphone um, and consumer electronic sales, those are the key concerns for investors going through this filing that hit yesterday evening. By the way, in terms of the proceeds, this is a 60 to $70 billion valuation, right? As far as we've reported. As, as far as we've reported, um, which means what? They walk away with SoftBank. Last we've reported, SoftBank would walk away with the 8 to $10 billion because they bought back the remaining 25% from their own vision fund. So they're selling shares into the open market. 8 to 10, we've been reporting that maybe it's going to be a bit lower because now they own the entirety of the company. So SoftBank actually brings in all of the sales. None of that money is going to exist Exactly. Ownership. That's the point. So none of these proceeds go get reinvested into oh, ARMS business. That. Yep. That's and an it, important point. And it, and it goes back to uh, SoftBank being able to take that cash and redeploy it to some of the other startups that they've tried to 
back and are looking to back and try to All right. create returns. H here's another thing I wonder what our reporting is showing because last quarter they, the company had little to no revenue growth. Dropped uh, about 1% year okay, over year. Okay, so or given year, that background, is there any view coming from the street on valuation yet? We saw, and yours truly reported on this, uh, we saw a, a Bernstein note laying out expectations around 40 billion. That was last month. When we crunched the numbers, looking at some comps, they've, we've been hear, ta hearing uh, investors in Wall Street talking up synopsis and cadence as better comps. When you look at a price of sales trailing on a 12 month average, valuation comes closer to 32 to 43 billion. So, and the company's looking for what? 60 to 70 as far as we've, and they bought that back that. That's a bit ass spread there, my friend. Well, they also bought back with that repurchase from SoftBank, they paid about 16 billion for that 25% stake. So $64 billion baked yep. in. But the one thing that was interesting in the filing is SoftBank's warns, and this is verbatim, investors are cautioned that the purchase price paid may not be indicative of, and is not intended to reflect expectations regarding the completed deal. So they I'm basically not, are warning that they paid a uh, valuation of $64 billion. Forget that. That's part of a different deal. Don't worry about well, ascribing that valuation. It's funny because that's the first place I would go to. Exactly. And that's what we're talking to investors and, and people who this watch This is not going to be an easy deal, is it? It's going to be a fascinating deal. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about at length about the dearth of IPOs. Yes. And the one view that I've been getting from a number of my sources is that Arm is the type of company, and they've stuck to their plans to go public this year, that could really go public in most any market. Okay. It was public once before, back in 2016, SoftBank took it private. It's more of a almost PE style play as opposed to your traditional uh, money burning VC backed company. And it's the only game in town if you want access to a new issue. If it does well, I guess there'll be a cascade of IPOs that follow. Yes and no. We're expecting potentially Instacart to flip their S1 sometime as early as this week. Clavio is another company. The big thing that I've been talking to my contacts, their view is fourth quarter 2023 will be interesting with some of these big companies that probably should have or could go at most any time. But the big focus is going to be early 2024 okay. when you're going to get more of those sweet spot IPOs. Just uh, on a different topic completely. We were talking and have been talking for a long time with Ira Jersey about soccer. And I know Messi's come here, so it's pretty exciting um, yeah. for a sport that otherwise is just deadly boring to watch. <laughs> um, what, why doesn't professional lacrosse uh, get a big pickup in this country? And I ask you, Bailey, because I've noticed that you were uh, a lacrosse beat reporter at Citrus TV. Yeah, man. Cut my wow. teeth at Syracuse <laughs> University, covering which I still view as probably the best men's lacrosse college team that did not win a national title. They were absolutely stacked. Yeah, and, and back when we were kids, that was it. It was them and James Johns Hopkins, and then now everybody plays. The Big Ten's all, all yeah. getting in on it. No, but that's interesting, Matt, because coming from the West Coast, I knew like two people who played lacrosse. It was a <laughs> rich kid San Diego sport that being east of L.A. was like, we play football. That's what right. men do. And in um, Ohio, by the way, same thing. Growing up in Ohio, lac lacrosse was something only kids in like New Jersey and Connecticut played. But now at, you know, the schools that I, all the schools I got kicked out of in central Ohio, <laughs> they all play lacrosse. Well, it's accelerating. The issue is in the, the this is the pitch. And I, I did a small stint covering sports here at Bloomberg and sports business is, is lacrosse is going to be gaining from parents who maybe don't want their kids to play football for fear of injuries, head injuries. The issue, the one kind of drawing factor is, and, and the reason it's compared to hockey is it's not a cheap sport. There aren't a lot of fields to play. So if you don't have a tremendous amount of income where you can find a stick and a ball and find someone to play with, you can't go pick up and play like soccer or football or basketball where there's a court or there's just a grass field. You need and the number one things. high school team in the country this year, the Lawrenceville School. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Bailey. Good stuff. Bailey Leadership's covers the markets. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Paul Sweeney, uh, live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We're doing that streaming thing on YouTube. So just head over to YouTube.com and uh, hit eh, Bloomberg Radio. We'll get you where you need to go. That'll work. Go uh, to YouTube.com and search Bloomberg Radio. There you go. 
you're into this thing. You know what's going on here. All right, so stream about, us live. Let's talk about the hotel business, particularly the extended stay uh, part of the business, which is probably a part of the business we don't talk about enough. Anna Skazafava joins us. She's the general manager and senior vice president of extended stay brands at Choice Hotels. Choice Hotels, of course, is a New York Stock Exchange listed company. CHH uh, is the ticker to load into your Bloomberg professional service. Anna, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate you coming in all the way from Rockville, Maryland. Talk to us about the extended stay business. What are the drivers of your business and what are the trends been, I, don't, I guess, over the last several years as the world's kind of reinvented itself a little bit? Yeah, no, that's great. So um, extended stay caters primarily to non-discretionary stays. So think um, traveling nurses, construction crews. So okay. we have a lot of tailwinds coming to us with the infrastructure bill, the CHIPS Act, et cetera. So we see a lot of demand in our future um, ahead of us at this point in time. I would say the one thing about the extended stay um, brands is that they're pretty resilient. So even in face of um, recessions and pandemics, we tend to have an occupancy premium over the rest of traditional hotels. Um, so even right now in the first half of the year, um, economy extended stay um, has a 19% occupancy point percentage over just regular really? economy. Economy, transient hotels um, so it's a very resilient business model I guess your biggest competitor right now would be Airbnb is that fair to say I mean if I was gonna go someplace and I had to stay there for two weeks that would be sorry to say my first thought <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Airbnb, though, when we look at that, their price points are a little bit different, and those guests don't tend to look for kind of the standard guest experience that we provide across um, that. So the way we think about extended stay is that it's apartment-like amenities with a hotel of a flexibility. So you still get the services, the cleaning, um, et cetera, that you would expect from a hotel, but you have a full-size kitchen in your room. You have some of those larger spaces and suites um, versus a, a small traditional hotel room. So are you primarily a franchise Correct. Company. Okay. Yes. So, how do you how do you grow your business in terms? Is it simply going out there and recruiting franchisees? How does that work? How, how does that grow? Yeah, that absolutely. But I think developers at this point in time are looking at extended stay as one of the hottest segments within okay. the lodging industry. It really, it's a hedge. It's a really different type of asset class than a traditional hotel. Um, so over the last couple of years, even even during 2020, um, Woodspring Suites, our largest brand, they ran GOP margins of 50%, and they've gone up from there. So last year, we were on average at 60%. So smart money is really kind of chasing us at this point in time and wanting to get into the segment. We've been able to capitalize on that. We've um, had over 50% more openings in the first half of this year than we did last year. We've grown our pipeline 17% just in the first half of this year. Um, so while we are, yes, of course, going after some of the larger developers, um, they are certainly seeking us out as well. So does the, uh, does the change in work from home or the evolution of the way we work have a big effect on your business? Yeah, we've seen a lot of stays now where, I mean, I hate the word leisure, but where you get the business traveler, right, and they're staying for five days and then they tack on. Wait, is that a word days. that people use? I, I mean, we do in the industry, yeah. Leisure? Leisure. leisure. Business, business leisure. leisure. <laughs> I cannot believe that you're allowed something? to use that word. <laughs> Learn it's something? pretty standard industry jargon for sure. <laughs> it works. Um, yeah, but that that certainly has changed. And then honestly, the um, reshoring of a manu American manufacturing has also been a great tailwind for us at this point in time. So any of those large semiconductor plants that you're starting to see move in, battery plants, et cetera, are also creating a lot of demand for the extended stay segment. How about, I mean, can I build a hotel these days? I mean, the banks are just pulling back on lending across, this, across the board. How does that impact, I guess, your franchisees? Yeah, so we're the only company that has two entry points into extended stay for both uh, the economy segment and the mid-scale segment. So what we've done, knowing that new construction lending is a challenge, right? And some of our franchisees can, can get that. They have community banks that they've got local relationships, proven track records, and so they're still getting that lending. Um, but a lot of folks um, where we have markets that have no extended stay supply, there are a ton of traditional hotels, we came up with a really innovative solution that we call kitchen in a box. So we worked with engineers, um, architects, the trades, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, et cetera, and came up with this concept where you can take a traditional hotel room and convert it into an extended stay room. And we have 20 of those transformations going on across the country. Now what's an extended stay room entail? So you must have a full-size kitchen. Full-size kitchen. Full-size kitchen. Okay. And the way that we like to think about it is guests use these rooms for both work, play, me space, right? They need to be flexible spaces so that it's more kind of like your home. Even thoughtful things like, you know, you want a larger vanity in the bathroom because if you're going to be there for many weeks, you want to be able to put all your stuff out, right? right. Um, so that's how we think about designing that with the consumer first and how they're going to use that space. How have... Uh labor costs been? Because I know, you know, in the pandemic or even at the end of the pandemic, Paul and I would interview um, hoteliers, 
Oh, do you say yeah. that? Mm. Hoteliers? That's pretty good. Yeah. And uh, they told us, you know, it's very difficult to get people to come to work. Yeah. So um, the beauty of extended stay is in the economy segment in particular, there's only six or seven full-time employees. And the reason that is, is because we only do housekeeping bi-weekly. So the labor model is super light in these hotels, which also enables those high margins that I spoke about earlier. So yes, we are not immune to that, but it certainly lends itself a little bit easier than what you're seeing in traditional I see. Those, so, so, so extended stay facilities are not housed within your traditional hotel facilities. They're actually completely separate yeah, entities. So, yeah. yeah, so, so take a um, Woodspring Suites, for instance. Prototype Prototype is 122 rooms, mm -hmm. um, and they come standard with the kitchens, etc. There's also guest laundry, um, fitness facilities, etc., so that you can really maintain your lifestyle there. So they, it, you would not see them with inside a traditional hotel. But no, like restaurants or any of that type of stuff. No. This is just no. stays. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, who do you compete against, really? Matt mentioned Airbnb, but on the, in terms of the traditional extended stay, who's the competition? Yeah, for you well, guys? I mean, we're starting to see a lot of new competitors come into the space. So Marriott, Hilton Hyde have all announced oh, really? um, brand launches at this point in time. I think for us, though, we've been in the space for a really long time. We acquired Woodspring Suites back in 2018 and have kind of reinvigorated the segment. We have over 400 open and operating extended stay hotels right now with another 300 in the pipeline. And where are those? Where, are there regional areas that you guys are focusing on or I mean coast to coast we certainly see a lot of demand right now in Texas and Florida yeah. Re relocation has been big for us as well so think um, places like Boise Idaho that are sure. fast growing yep. kind of um, urban areas at this point in time talk to us about rowing yeah <laughs> so you Wait, row, she, what do you row? she's in the athletic hall of fame <laughs> I mean, that's no joke. What's a coxswain? Is that the one that says stroke, stroke, or go? Uh, it's a little more sophisticated now. Okay. So you actually have a microphone, and there are um, speakers underneath the seat, right? Really? And so I could whisper, and the crew would be able to hear you. But yes, I, I steered the boat and then you know made sure that we were making race moves. When but it was you sit in the front, though, right? No, um, in, the back. Back. in the back. Oh, in the back. So you can see. I see. Yeah. So yeah. you actually do steer, literally. Yeah, literally. And then you're the motivator of the crew. Correct. Absolutely. So what's the Athletic Hall of Fame like? Do you have like a your jersey there or? I have my, my plaque and it's, yeah. uh, you know, on the riverfront. So we have our boathouse out there. So that's, that's and where it is. is. And what river is Washington? The Chester River. So in Maryland. Nice. Yep. See? Yeah. I don't know anybody who rows. Do you? I, uh, yeah, I know some, I know some row. I actually only know women who row. Uh, but it's a yeah. big D3 sport. It's huge. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. I mean, I know yeah. a lot of Boston women who row on um, the yeah. Charles. That's amazing. Yeah. We, yeah. we we came in third, I want to say, one of the years on the Charles. And of course, it's a big tradition to throw the coxswain in if you win. Uh, so, <laughs> All right, fun. good stuff. Anna Skazafava, <laughs> general manager uh, and senior VP of Extended Stay Brands at Choice Hotels. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio. The TuneIn app. Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. You know, Matt, I don't know about this whole, you know, yield curve thing. It's, you know, I'm an equities guy, so this is kind of something new for me. But Lisa Bromowitz has been schooling me for years on this. And the latest thing she says I have to focus on is this real yield for the 10-year hit 2%, uh, the highest in a very long time, I think since 2009. What does that mean? I don't know. So I'm going to ask uh, somebody who, who's smart about this kind of stuff. This is what the Fed wanted, right? They said they wanted to get real yields positive. At yep. the time that Powell was complaining <clears throat> about it, they were negative. Yep. Um, and now they're way up there. So, so the question is, are they then uh, able to achieve their goal of reducing inflation to 2%? And let's ask somebody about that. Jay Hatfield, he's the CEO and founder and portfolio manager of Infrastructure Capital Management. Uh, he's been kind enough to join us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. So, Jay... Talk to us about your call on inflation. I got this real yield thing at 2%. That's the highest since July of 2009, so that gets my attention. What's going on out there? Thanks, Paul and Matt, for having me on. Well, um, we actually think that the Fed is a little bit of out of play right now. Okay. So in other words, they're, they may or may not raise one more time. We don't think they will. Um, there was a story in the journal today, but we did some – uh, data in, in preparation for this. The labor market's really weakening. About 60% of jobs added are in the medical sector. And we all know that that's uh, more of a secular increase than cyclical. And also wages are attenuating. So I think that data, we don't think the Fed's going to raise, they don't know that yet, <laughs> okay. but they're going to get some more data, particularly on the, um, on the labor side, even though that doesn't really matter, but that's what they focus on. 
And also inflation is going to gradually cool. The measurement of inflation already has cooled, but the measurement of inflation will continue okay. to cool. So we're optimistic that the um, Fed will not raise again. But we're very concerned about the ECB, in case you want to talk about that, because we think that's critical. To well, the, let's right. get to that. Uh, yeah. But I do want to talk about your view on inflation, because you mm -hmm. have your own index, CPI mm -hmm. uh, R. I'm looking at it on the infrastructure, on infracapfunds.com on your website. Um, how do you see this working out in terms of inflation? Is it really mm -hmm. going to come back down to 2% and is that going to be anytime soon? Um, may maybe the hike one more time, but do we hold at that level or are you worried it bounces back? Well, the, the two things to focus on in terms of potential bounce back are energy prices and housing prices. So energy, we do a lot of work on that. We think that we're kind of stuck in this 75, 95 range. And also in the fall, it should weaken up. So we're not worried about energy. And also it's important in the US, we have natural gas that trades at the equivalent of about $18 a barrel. Yeah, so it's okay. highly deflationary here, not true of the rest of the world. Rest of the world, natural gas trades roughly BTU wise the same as oil. So we're not concerned about that. And I think the chances of housing prices taking off like a rocket when mortgage rates are seven and a half percent is close to zero. So we're not concerned about a reacceleration. And then <clears throat> we know that the, the current measurements for um, CPI and PCE are flawed because of their shelter component. And also we don't like PCE because it has 20% medical, but I would say we don't, we don't um, stick this on our website, but we calculate PCE R. So that corrects for shelter. And that's only at 2.6% right now. And well, uh, CPIR is only 1% year over year, right? Correct, yes. So we think inflation's already behind that problem behind us and no signs, you know, again, looking at the forward indicators because we were massively concerned about inflation early 21. So we think that's behind us, whether the Fed raises one more time or not, we don't think it's that critical, but we do think the global tight monetary policy is an issue. And I think that's what is driving long-term rates up right now. So, uh, all right, let's get then to Europe. Um, what's the inflation picture look like to you over there? If it's subdued here, um, but you mentioned we have deflationary um, natural gas prices, and of course they don't, mm -hmm. uh, how does inflation look to you on the continent? <laughs> well, I think that that's, that is a real problem because they've had an enormous increase over the last two years, and that's they're less competitive. But our biggest concern is that global monetary base, and we will publish this on our website as well, although you can get the data. You can just, if you can add, you can get it on the terminal <laughs> as well. <laughs> but it's still good to publish it because even I haven't focused on enough. Dropped by 700 billion in the last two months, which is an enormous drop. That's a now, 3%. Now, what, what dropped by 700 billion? The global monetary base. Okay. So the global uh, central bank sucked out $700 billion of capital. And we've seen M2 fall here as well. <clears throat> right, yeah. yeah. So those are a little bit more lag. But if you look at the, mo I would suggest look at the monetary base because that's the leading indicator because mm -hmm. it's the major component. And I would also say don't ignore this. So I've made a good call to at least our clients. When the Fed intervened, I said, okay, that's a sign back in the pandemic. They're adding you know, 1.2 trillion of capital to the capital market every year. That's just enormous. Mm -hmm. That's like Warren Buffett, you know, putting his 100 billion to work 10 times. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't ignore the monetary base and those ch radical changes in particular. So if they're small, you can ignore them. So we think that's the key driver behind this big rise in rates. And we did that work because really, frankly, our call was they were gonna drop and it was dead wrong. So we said, well, how can this be? And that's when we discovered, because we should have been tracking it as well more closely, that the ECB has just done this massive QT, and that affects all rates in the, in the world. Uh, if you look at it, uh, our bond is 85% correlated with all the benchmark bonds. So coming up with an explanation just focused on the U.S. is not going to be correct when you're talking about the world bond market. So what happens to interest rates? When can I refinance my mortgage at a lower rate? <laughs> Paul well, is uh, <clears throat> single-minded and yes. focused on the high mortgage rate that he got. It's adjustable, though, because he was figuring at the time, well, next year I'll be able to refinance at a lower rate. 
Yes, so I have adjustable rate mortgages as well, so I'm very <laughs> focused on this. But um, I don't think that we're going to get any relief till probably mid next year because the Fed's about a year behind what they should be doing. So you should have cut when the banking crisis started. And that is another reason why they should pause, and I think that maybe even they'll figure this out, is that the banking system is under pressure, being downgraded. They were downgraded yep. this morning. They should be focused on that. Uh, so I think we'll get relief next year. But the thing to watch and the reason that we're sticking with our bullish call on interest rates is that we do think that the, U the um, European economy is going to crack. Uh, they have mostly floating rate mortgages, mm -hmm. uh, way more than they do in the United States. Uh, they have this natural gas problem. Uh, Germany is levered to China. And their yep. ECB is a single mandate uh, central bank. So they're going to continue to tighten really probably till their economies crack. So I think that's when rates will come down, long rates will come down, when it becomes more obvious that Europe is headed into a recession, which is our call that they're almost certainly going to probably even a substantial Despite recession. all the Americans over there traveling? <laughs> yeah, that, at the margin, that does help. That does, okay. Yeah, the U.S. definitely does prop up the rest of the world. But still, when you think about all those factors are negative, then what is the bull case for Europe? So how about China, just because we've been talking a lot over the last several weeks reporting on the, the weaker than expected economic data out of China. What's, how do you kind of view all that? Well, there, when, with regard to oil, which is what we mostly focus on China okay. about, is that the thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that, of course, um, reporters have to write stories. So why is oil down? <clears throat> we talked to them about this. Well, it's because of China. Well, that's <laughs> usually not the case. They have very slow growth in oil demand that's very sticky. So we don't think that that demand's going to drop. But <clears throat> we, we also think that that could be positive for long-term rates because the EC, I'm sorry, the, the Chinese central bank is definitely going to cut rates. There's a disappointment when they cut last time, but they're going to continue to cut rates. They've really hammered their economy through regulation. It's a good example of why maybe capitalism is superior to communism. And so when you do that, it hurts economic growth. And so they're going to offset it with monetary policy, and that should also be bullish for long-term rates. And I'm just reading your notes here real quick, 30 seconds. Fourth quarter for the stock market, S&P, range of 4,500 to 5,000. Correct. Although I would say that that's dependent on rates at least stop rising, okay. you know, as fast as they have been over the last uh, month or so. Okay. And anything added, uh, Jackson Hole? We think it's going to be a non-event because the Fed's already signaled what they want to do. They have the dot plot, and we know there's a dovish camp so that we won't get a repeat of last year where Powell comes out and, and kind of talks the market down. Right. Interesting. All right, Jay. Ah, so you don't think there'll be a hawkish bent? A little bit, but not anything significant like it was last Nothing year. Nothing to write home about. All right. But let's send the team out there anyway. Yeah. yeah two. Why not? <laughs> two teams. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Jay Hatfield, CEO, founder, and portfolio manager, does it all. Uh, infrastructure capital management, one of the smarter discussions Matt and I uh, have as we th uh, try to think about these markets and navigate through these And I like markets. his website, InfraCap. InfraCap? InfraCapFunds.com. Boom, there you go. Go check it out. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern. On Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's get this banking thing. We got S&P coming in better late than never, I guess, kind of saying, hey, there's challenges for the uh, regional banking sector, and they take down some names here. Uh, let's break it down with our experts. That would be Herman Chan, and that would be Arnold Kakuda. Herman joins us live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Arnold Kakuda making use of the Zoom functionality out there. He joins us as well. Arnold, let's start with you on the credit side. Where do you see kind of the pressure um, that we're seeing across the regional bank space uh, in the credit side? Yes, um, I, I think some of these actions by Moody's and S&P, I think just gives us a reminder that this, um, you know, now I guess I wouldn't call it a crisis anymore, but, you know, these issues still exist where there is pressure on, on these banks and, and, and their balance sheets, right? Uh, funding costs are rising, deposits have fled, yes. So I, I think a lot of these things that um, the rating agencies are coming out with now are, yeah, it, it is backward looking, but it is a reflection that 
you know, all things aren't all fine and dandy in regional bank land. So if, if, if I wanted to go out, I'm a regional bank, a reasonable credit quality. Can I go out there and raise capital in, in your credit markets? And if so, like, yeah, is it gonna, am I going to really have to pay through the nose? Oh, I mean, you know, the the before March, uh, regional bank debt, it was, you know, we're, we're in a totally different world. It used to be they trade really tight and you couldn't get enough of it, right? And it trade tight for the credit rating. Now we're in this opposite world of, you know, it trades uh, wider. I mean, things have, you know, gotten better, obviously, since the heydays of, of uh, March and May. But, you know, compared to before, spreads are wider. And um, a lot of these will be hit with new debt requirements. So we expect debt issuance to, to pick up for a lot of these. And we have seen um, a couple of regional banks tap the market. We have Charles Schwab today. Um, and then we had, what is it, Huntington and uh, PNC come you know, in, in, the, in the past week or so. So it is available. Um, if the debt does come, uh, you know, with, with some uh, a little bit meat on the bone, let's let's put it that then there will be demand. Herman, what do you think about the, uh, you know, the banks that were specifically downgraded by S&P? You've got Key Corp, Comerica, Valley National, UMB and Associated Bank Corp. I would say that the the issues that that the rating agencies have highlighted, a couple of them, Key Corp, Comerica, they're facing some weaker net interest margins than some others that in the in our our peer group. That's really driven by um, some higher deposit costs. Um, they they actually these two banks in particular miss have mishedged their balance sheet a bit, where they were expecting interest rates to decline. Um, potentially next year, and it seems like we're in a higher for longer environment. So that's actually crimping their margins a bit more than some others. Is the, is the deposit flight um, the kind of thing that's still ongoing? You know, I was actually at uh, a cocktail party. I think, Shocking. I, I think like three or four weeks ago okay. with uh, uh, a group of ladies talking about um, how they got, you know, high interest rates in this one bank account. And mm -hmm. I saw one woman, uh, you know, just over the course of a conversation at like 6 p.m. on a Saturday say, you know what, I'm just going to move like $100,000 from my savings account and my bank that I've always used right. into this. I can't remember if it was um, the Goldman Sachs account or some other, but, mm -hmm. you know, four and a half percent yielding savings account and right. just boom, done. Right. So what we've seen since the fallout in March and April is that the deposit actual the deposit balances have actually stabilized across the industry and how that's happened is they're just paying up for those deposits so you're you're seeing high interest savings accounts high yield savings accounts you know approaching 5 even above 5% CDs above 5% for a one year term 15 month term so that's really the gist of it. Uh, the banks are paying up, and that's really crimping net interest margins and, and pressuring profitability going forward. Hey, uh, Arnold, are you seeing any investors come in, in in your market and saying, boy, I see some real value here in some of these bonds? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, definitely, for, you know, in a market, let's say until, until from May to August, right? It was a classic uh, risk on uh, treasury yields higher, spreads tightening. And, and, and in a world where everything seemed to be pricing to perfection, one of the things that are st were still cheap is, is kind of the, the regional banks, right? And given what they went through. So, um, so yeah, I, I think there is a lot of demand uh, for regionals, but I think at the right price, right? And, and if you look at credit spreads now where they are, you know, tighter, if, if you would have woken up today versus, you know, not knowing what happened from, from, you know, all of this year, you wouldn't even know that there was a banking crisis this year, right? Given, given how things have recovered. So, um, you know, I, th I think at the right price, um, th there'll be demand, but, um, you know, things have, you know, we've had a bit of a, a kind of, you know, everything sell off in August, right? That That's coincided with these um, rating downgrades, rate negative outlook cuts. But um, I, I think things had been pricing a little bit for perfection. But I, I think if if these new issues come to market uh, with a bit of a little bit of meat on the bone, that, then I think you, you'll see investors step up and, and go for it. The stocks haven't really recovered, Herman. If you look at mm -hmm. if I look at KRE, for example, yep. um, which is the uh, the regional s p a spider s p regional banking etf it's still at the same levels that it hit after 
um, you know, the, the, the big problems that we had, the, the drop that we saw in March. Right. Uh, the stocks have rebounded a bit from the lows back in April and May, but still well below uh, pre SVB uh, fallout. So, I mean, the KRE dropped to 44 and a half on March 13th, and right now it's trading at uh, 43.60. Right. Valuations are really reflecting the tough environment that that Moody's and S and P ha- have articulated. So. Tougher profitability, weaker lending, uh, regulatory requirements are going to increase, and we still haven't really seen um, the the shoot a drop on the asset quality side, in particular office commercial real estate quite yet. So there's going to be a lot of headwinds, and the banks will just need to navigate that. And, and any upside really is is going to be dependent on where interest rates go and potential cuts down the road. So, Herman, what do we know about the uh, regulatory changes coming along? Mm-hmm. So, the regulators and the Fed have have put out a uh, thousand page document <laughs> that uh, outlines some changes to the regulatory requirements for particularly the largest banks and the and the largest regional banks of 100 billion dollars and above that's really focused on tightening how capital ratios are calculated including unrealized losses in the securities portfolio in the AFS securities portfolio into capital calculations um, increasing uh, the debt stack, as Arnold mentioned a bit earlier. But there's still going to be um, some other areas that the regulators are focused on. Uh, recall during the SVB crisis that uninsured deposits was a big thing. So the FDIC is looking at that. And then the Fed's also going to come out with some regulatory issues on uh, liquidity as well. So there's still more down the road. And so the banks will just need to have to manage through it. All right, guys, uh, really appreciate getting the update there. Uh, again, S&P following Moody, Moody's and downgrading some of those regional banks. Uh, really nothing new in kind of what they're doing, but uh, simply kind of reflecting kind of what I believe the market's known for some time. Herman Chan, Arnold Kakuta, they cover the regional banks, all the banks uh, on the regional side for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Arnold on the credit side, uh, Herman on the equity side. So we got you all covered there on the regional bank space. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's talk Microsoft. It would like to buy Activision. In fact, so much so that it's got a $69 billion transaction on the table. Uh, needs regulatory approval, and the UK was really a sticking point, but maybe they're rethinking their strategy here. Maybe this deal gets done. So let's go to Jen Ree. She's a senior litigation analyst. She's covering all the antitrust stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence. She joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. So, Jen, it looks like the UK is taking a little bit of an, an, an about face and may take a fresh look at this deal. Yeah, and that looks like what's happening. As a matter of fact, they've been looking at it again for about a month. And I think Microsoft actually tried to push this through on a second look without doing what it's done now, which has made some concessions to to transfer some games to Ubisoft. And that didn't really work. Um, We thought maybe there'd be a final report by August 29th by the UK. Now it's been pushed to October because the deal's been restructured and they have to take a look at that, the new concession. But it's looking pretty good for Microsoft. You know, they've been talking to the UK. They know where they are. Uh, there's been open communication, and I really doubt they'd be moving forward with this unless they thought that they were going to get clearance at the end of this road. So, yeah, look, just looking at the stock of Ubisoft, which trades uh, on French exchange up 8.5% today. So are those concessions going to be um, what the UK wanted to see? Um, isn't it all about Call of Duty? I mean, does anything else matter? I mean, really, this was about Call of Duty, but the UK has made it beyond, you know, they don't know what's coming out from Activision. These are content creators, right? And maybe it'll be the Activision that creates the next Call of Duty or, you know, the next really popular game. So they were really just concerned more about the future because they think the future will be more of what they they call these AAA games. And also the future will be streaming games through the cloud rather than downloading them to, to hardware. So that's what they're trying to protect. And that's what they've done by requiring or Microsoft agreeing that they will transfer all of the Activision games, including Call of Duty, for the next 15 years to Ubisoft. So Ubisoft can then license those games to be streamed through the cloud. 
Where do we stand in the U.S.? Yeah, well, the U.S., you know, it's been really quiet and you don't see much in the news. There's still an appeal. The FTC is still <laughs> fighting this deal in the U.S. They lost in court and then they lost their attempt to get an emergency stay after they lost their attempt to block the deal. They do have an appeal pending. The briefing's going to be done in September. Um, you could probably have a oral argument maybe by the end of this year. I mean, if this deal gets U.K. Uh, a, a clearance in October and the deal closes, it means the FTC's appeal will be ongoing after the deal's already consummated and integrated. So does that typically happen? That there's still <laughs> going to be a review of a deal that's closed? It, it can happen, and the FTC has done that. Um, I'm a little surprised by it. You know, after they lost in the district court and then lost their effort to get an emergency stay, I didn't really think they'd continue to pursue this appeal because they lost pretty soundly in court. I mean, the judge really said you just don't really have any evidence to prove out your theories of harm in this case. Um, and I don't see this, I see it as a losing battle. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised that they're continuing on that road. They may still withdraw it um, after this agreement with the UK. That might give them the ammunition they need to say, okay, things are different now. Is it political? So the Biden can go on the campaign trail <laughs> and say, I'm tough on business? Of I'm course it's political. <laughs> it's always political. I'm trying to ask a nice I, the I, road question. You know, antitrust decisions on mergers are not supposed to be political. And really, honestly, in the past, they, they mostly were not. I would say now it has moved into the political realm for sure. Yep. I mean, you have a political viewpoint right now that we've allowed too much consolidation in the market and we need to stop it. We need to slow down M&A activity in many industries. And that's why we're seeing these aggressive act actions by the FTC and DOJ. And that is political. All right, so what else do we have out there? So it looks like this deal's moving forward. What else is in your... Hang, of, hang on, let me just what? get quickly. Sure. So if um, the FTC and Khan, I mean, clearly they're going to appeal and appeal mm -hmm. and appeal, but mm -hmm. at some point that's over. Um, and if the UK approves this, who else has to give it um, the bless their blessing? I mean, is there an EU regulator that they need? Is there a Chinese regulator that they need? Is there a you know, Asian, African regulator that they need? Does Australia want to block the deal? I mean, you know, they have everybody else they need. And it's really telling because almost all of these jurisdictions and some of which are very serious when it comes to antitrust, like Brazil, cleared this deal without concessions. Now, the EU is saying, look, this is a new deal. It's been restructured. And we reached a settlement with Microsoft and we need to make sure this doesn't impact our settlement. So we may have to take another look. I don't think that's going to be a hindrance to getting the deal closed by the deal's end date in October, though. And just refresh our memory, the UK gets a look at this deal because of Brexit. So they no yes. longer abide by the EU review right. of the deal. Right. Ah. Right. That's a, think about the that The UK <laughs> used to be part of the EU, yes. and it was part of Brussels review. Uh, okay. It got, you know, glommed in with all the other EU countries um, that were part of that. You know, there were thresholds that could be triggered in just the UK previously, even before Brexit. But most big deals were, were assessed by the EU and not by UK. Oh, well, that maybe makes Brexit all worth it then. To get, <laughs> to get, to get to review deals. Yeah, destroy the economy, but yep. review deals. <laughs> by the way, in terms of not political, I'm looking at the uh, FTC board here. Um, Lena Khan, it says she's a Democrat, uh -huh. right? Went to Yale Law School, by the way. Rebecca Slaughter, uh, she's a Democrat. That's right. Went to Yale Law School, by the way. Oh, I'm sensing something. Alvaro <laughs> Bedoya. <laughs> Um, he's a Democrat. Also a Democrat. Went to Yale Law School, by the way. <laughs> What's the deal? I mean, What's if it's not political, deal, yeah. why do they stack the board with Democrats who went to Yale? <laughs> well, any administration, right, yeah. can, uh, can appoint commissioners, right? And there are five commissioners. And no more than three can be from one political party. So generally, when we have a Democrat oh, the in the two, White the House. The other two spaces are vacant. The I other two are out. vacant, yeah. right? <laughs> now, there's some, there some talk of nominees and appointees coming, right? Uh, but there's really no pressure on Biden to do that and move forward with that. I think he probably will. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because it requires a majority vote. So when you have three Democrats and two Republicans, which you'll eventually have once those two spots are filled, you're still likely going to have the majority vote be along the Democratic lines. And these three have pretty much aligned on almost everything so far. And in my world of media and telecommunications, it's the Federal Communications right. Commission and it's the exact same, same gig. situation. You know, whoever's in power gets the, uh, the, mm -hmm. get, get, gets the role there. Um, and Yale, is Yale the best law school, most, most, most <laughs> rankings? Certainly on the I left. I don't know. Apparently, they like 
the antitrust regulators. But not like on the rankings, isn't it? I guess it's Yale. I, I think it's up there. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. But I, I, I think I think it's up there. I mean, look, it's Yale. Yeah. Exactly. Of course, it's great. Exactly. All right. So what else uh, on the antitrust front? Um, are you looking at here? What are some of the big uh, trades out there that are still need some approval? Well, you know, we're looking at Adobe Figma. Now that obviously one of the, one is a private company, but that's been sort of lagging. I suspect the DOJ is likely to challenge that deal. You know, we're waiting for Kroger and Albertsons. That's before the FTC. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the FTC went to court to try to block that deal as well. And trial will start in October um, in the JetBlue Spirit deal. See, like who cares? I mean, JetBlue <laughs> and Spirit, do we care? I guess you're um, from the markets that are don't get a lot of service, mm -hmm. and you care about. I want both JetBlue and Spirit to serve my right. market. I mean, they have two very different models, right? JetBlue is considered a low cost carrier, whereas Spirit's ultra low cost, which really means ultra everything's a la carte, right? You can you can get the absolute cheapest fare without any other perks, no food, no luggage, nothing else, and you can't pick your seat. There, there is a, a set of consumers that prefers to have that option, yep. right, for when they travel. And what will happen is that this deal, at least the allegation is, will take that option out of many markets or reduce the option from two, which were Frontier and Spirit, down to just one, which would be Frontier when JetBlue takes over. On the other hand, it's hard for JetBlue and also mm -hmm. for Spirit and Frontier to compete right. with um, the duopoly that we essentially have here, right? Um, you've got Delta, United, and American, American um, yeah. who hog all the slots. You know, and that's, that's what JetBlue says. Right. And that's their argument. And yeah. that's been an argument in airline mergers with the, some of the low cost carriers and the ultra low cost carriers in the past. I, I will say that in, in 20 years that I've been watching this, the argument that we need to merge in order to better compete with the top guys never seems to work. It just doesn't really work because if you take that merger on its own and it's anti-competitive and might have a price increasing effect or an output reducing effect, it doesn't really matter that much. It can't be outweighed by that argument. I'm looking at the Spirit map. I mean, they fly pretty much everywhere. I mean, including the Caribbean and uh, right. Central America and stuff like that. So that's a, it's a much bigger, more denser map than I thought. So, uh, been but only in this, essentially, uh, you know, only in sort of North America. Yeah, yeah, right. North and Central America. Yeah, so not uh, any international stuff other than. And JetBlue is now branched out. So now they go to London, they go to yep. uh, mm -hmm. Amsterdam, and they go to Paris. All I right. believe. Yeah, yeah but that so. was hindered a little bit yep. because the Department of Justice challenged their Northeast alliance with American, yep. Yep. right? Which kind of hindered some of that. All right, Jen. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thank Jen Reese, senior litigation analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence. You're listening to the tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio. The two in app bloomberg.com and the bloomberg business app you can also listen live on amazon alexa from our flagship new york station just say alexa play bloomberg 1130 one of the areas of the market that we've been talking a lot about over the last several years increasingly so is the private credit market we all know about the private equity business but the private credit business has been a uh, been getting a lot of capital flows and has been very active I want to get a little bit more details on that market. Jackie Ward joins us. She's a director of private investments for UMB Bank Family Wealth. Uh, she joins us uh, via Zoom. Jackie, talk to us about how you guys at UMB, uh, you know, address and deal and, and play in the private credit business. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, here at UMB, there's a number of different ways we kind of play in the private credit business. In my world, uh, we have a couple of bank owned funds that invest in private credit. So we're regularly looking at opportunities in the private credit space, mezzanine debt, junior lien debt, uh, and working with companies that way. Uh, from UMB Bank standpoint, as a senior lender, we also often work with junior capital providers to fill out the rest of the capital stack. So we get to interact with private credit, whether it's from a senior position or actually doing investment in private credit ourselves. So uh, my understanding is the private credit business really kind of took hold in terms of, of growing after the great financial crisis when a lot of the banks from a regulatory standpoint had to pull back a little bit from certain types of loans in terms of what they could own on their balance sheet. Is that still the primary driver of, of what's driving the growth of this business? I think it's a little bit of both. I think 2008 put private credit on the map because the question in 2008 was when are big banks going to come back into lending? Um, and I think the answer was it might take some time. And so you saw the launch of private credit. Uh, but these days, I think private credit is growing a lot just around um, direct lending efforts. Also, as banks kind of tighten in general, 
you're seeing less senior stretch debt, you're seeing more debt fall into the private credit space, and you're also seeing Unitranche financing become a huge spot in the market. Um, so with syndications down in general, a lot of companies are looking for a single provider that can provide a, a senior junior credit type blend through one instrument versus working with two different providers. And that's driving a lot of growth as well. You know, Jamie Dimon, I think, it, it, probably talking his own book, but, you know, he kind of says, hey, this private credit market's not regulated. Do we really know what's going on out there? How do, how do you respond to that? You know, private credit, these are funds. They're regulated as funds and asset managers. They're not regulated by bank regulators. I think there's a few different ways to look at that. Um, one, they're not regulated by bank regulators because they have a different source of funds. So private credit funds are also are raising money directly to invest in private credit as opposed to using depositor money. Um, and because of that, they have, they're able to take a little bit different outlook and potentially longer point of view. Um, I do think with any private investment, you know, the lack of regulation makes it really important to know who you're working with. Uh, you know, private credit funds that have long histories or attached to institutions like UMB that have long histories tend to do well because, of course, we're, we're working with a broader market. I think it just goes back to diligence and knowing who you're working with and who you're investing your dollars with. What types of deals um, are you guys seeing these days? You know, in our group, we're seeing a lot of deals in the manufacturing distribution space, um, especially in distribution where you might be dealing with an asset like company that still has a lot of working capital needs, a lot of growth. Um, we're also seeing a lot of bolt-on deals. So in our portfolio, the vast majority of our companies are platform companies. So we're actively looking for new opportunities and looking for M&A opportunities. And it's a great way for us to put in more junior debt. So with bank credit kind of tightening, some of that senior stretch debt falling into our space is creating a lot of opportunity in both of those industries. And do most of the deals that come across your desk, are they from are they private equity sponsored deals primarily? Yeah, we work primarily with private equity sponsors as well as, you know, LBO type funds. Um, we're often working with them or independent sponsors where they're taking down the entire opportunity and they're looking for partners in the capital stack. Interesting. So what is deal flow like these days? Because we've heard from, you know, some of the larger publicly traded investment banks that not a lot getting done per se. What are you seeing in, in, in your market? You know, we work kind of in the lower middle market and we're actually seeing a lot of opportunity. Uh, most of the deals that we're investing in, you know, we're looking at enterprise values of 100 million or under and activity in that space. You still have a lot of companies owned by generations that are looking to make exits. You still have a lot of companies that are seeing an opportunity for M&A. Um, so we're still seeing a good number of deals in our space. I think as you move up market, the markets get a little bit tighter and a little bit harder to raise debt. Um, so we're very happy to be in the space we're in. And you guys, UMB, you're based in Kansas City, right? Yeah. And so do you do, I mean, do you try to lend your regional expertise to the private equity sponsors out there, the companies out there? Is that kind of where you guys, uh, you know, kind of do your knitting? So, you know, we get to work with the private equity groups in a lot of different ways. Um, we have ways on the commercial bank side that we work with our private equity groups. Our bank is largely located, you know, Midwest focus. Groups like mine, we operate coast to coast, working with different private equity sponsors on direct investment in their deals, either using mezzanine or minority equity. Um, but we often, you know, UMB Bank is one large family. So we're often working with all the different divisions, you know, in concert to make sure that we're looking at the deal the right way. Interesting. So here we've got a big, big, uh, increase in the interest rates over the past 12 to 18 months. How's that impacted uh, your business? Maybe what kind of deals you see, what kind of structures you put in place? You know, in, in our world, um, a lot of our deals, you know, slightly higher interest rate, interest only. We still have a lot of room and flexibility on that spread. I know one thing that we're watching just in the market in general is private credit is doing really well right now. Um, I think there are a lot of funds that might have put out notes 12 to 18 months ago in a different rain environment. Uh, so we're keeping a really close eye on defaults coming into the back end of this year and early next year to make sure that doesn't have an impact on them. Uh, but kind of going back to the source of funding for a lot of private credit, because we're not utilizing deposit dollars in that sense, we have a different kind of cost structure that we get to compare against. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility. And so for your funds, who's a typical investor? Uh, for our funds, so on our family wealth side, we do have a number of single asset holdings that tend to be institutional and high net worth. Um, the primary fund we invest private credit out of is a bank-owned fund. Um, and so 
a number of years ago, the bank seeded us with cash and we've been recycling that capital right. since. All right, fascinating stuff. Always love talking about the private credit business. Again, a fast, fast growing business within financial services. Uh, seemed to spring out of nowhere after the great financial crisis and now it's a major, major player. Uh, Jackie Ward, uh, she's the director of private investments at UMB Bank Family Wealth. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at PT Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.